On today's episode of the Unveil podcast, I interview James Williams. James is a certified high performance coach. He is passionate about focusing on creating outer world impact through inner world mastery. His passion for mastering physical, mental, and emotional performance in pursuit of his own life goals is only matched by his dedication to supporting his clients' belief that anything is possible and available for them. And I have experienced this personally. You will hear in today's episode how I received James's inspiration and service. And you'll also learn a bit about his personal journey and how he got to where he is today. James, during this episode, takes us through a phenomenal exercise about being in the present moment. And he turns the tables on what you might think of selfishness. Enjoy the episode. And if you want to learn any more about James, all of the information that you need is in the show notes. So welcome to the Unveil podcast, James Williams. Thank you very much. It's great so to be good here. to have you here. Everyone who is following along with our journey will know that I have already interviewed your beautiful and gorgeous and amazing wife, Emily. And today we have the pleasure of having the other half of the Williams duo, James. And what I'd like to start with is you giving our listeners a little bit of an insight into what you do currently in your kind of professional world and how you serve. Okay, so that question, it's always an interesting question, isn't it? What do we do? So I guess the title, um, one of my qualifications is a certified high performance coach. I think that what I do is serve very ambitious people, predominantly women throughout through my wife's business, I Help My Life, but through mine, The Growth Edge, just people who are very ambitious, whether it be personally or professionally, and they know they can achieve more, they've got lots of incredible ideas, but physically and mentally, they can't imagine how they would have the energy, the bandwidth, the confidence to even try. And I come at this from a very strategic perspective very tangible perspective and just absolutely love when people realize that they are capable Mm -hmm. and that when they learn to focus on what I call the business of you um, that's the business that when running effectively and efficiently means that anything's possible and so Mm -hmm. really I'm here just to to be that teacher mentor coach whatever you want to call me uh, to guide um, and teach and strategize along that journey. Mm, I love that. And you have some great terminology that I'd love to break down for our listeners. So business of you, what Mm. does that really mean, James? Well, the reason I came up with that is a lot of the people I've worked with and work with are business owners, or Mm. they at least have very high positions in business. Mm. So extrinsically, they're very clear about how to break down a business, make sure that it's cash flow is running well, that the company culture is well, that the leadership's great, and that there's profitability, that there's passive income, right? Mm-hmm. So using that terminology to break down how this thing runs, that how our mind runs, how our body runs, how it all flows together, mm-hmm. really is the business of you. And as I always say, business is personal. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm putting effort into my business, then it's the quality, the quality is coming from me. So if I'm not capable of creating a quality output, then the business will suffer. So get this business sorted first, the output towards everything else, not just your business, but your relationships, everything um, is going to be positively impacted. Mm. And all of our long-term Unveil listeners will suddenly be recognizing just why James and I get on so well, because that's literally that holistic nature of understanding that you can't segment your life it is all one thing and like optimizing our vehicle and ourself is the way to have optimal output is exactly where we live as well. So Mm -hmm. this is why James and Emily are so key to our little journey, but what I'd really love you to dig into for myself as well as our listeners is that terminology of language around the business of you, you really make it professional in terms of like doing the business language, don't you? Yeah. Would you like to give us our listeners a few little insights, just a few little gems? Need to real yeah, work. so well, so let's think about how a company runs. So, you know, all companies have someone at the top that oversees everything in that company. So you could say within us, that's like our observer. That's our ability to kind of step above our lives and say, okay, what's going on? Where am I going? Where have I been? What's serving me? What's not serving me? It's the kind of like the overarching view. And then you might have the director, right? So the director role within us is the, is the action taker. It's the, the director controls our attitude. It controls 
our response, our reactions. It controls the actions that we take. And then we might have other roles, like we might have the guardian. So the guardian is the, the role we play for ourselves that really manages, you know, from a health perspective, what we eat, um, the people we allow into our lives, you know, the environments we allow ourselves to go into. You know, really all these roles, and there's a few more, they're about taking responsibility mm. for this business, for you. Mm. But you are responsible for, for what you perceive out in the world. You're responsible for your ability to take action. And I think that that's the real key. And any good leader of a company takes responsibility for the outcomes of that company. Even if it wasn't them directly in that role, they take responsibility because they, by doing that, they're empowering themselves to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And this is really what I mean by the business of you is I want everyone to take responsibility to then feel the empowerment of, I can do something about this and I don't have to wait for the world to change for me to start moving forward. Yeah. And I love that. And just to underscore that, it's that responsibility is not disempowering. It's empowering. It's not, it's all my fault. It's, it's all within my agency to uh, uh, eventually shift the outcomes. That's right. So I break that down. You know, the word responsibility is your ability to respond, mm. right? Your response ability. Yes. But we all have, there's a big difference between a reaction which quite often comes from the worst version of ourselves mm -hmm. and then the response, which is, okay, how would the best version of me respond to this situation to problem solve, to get the best outcome, and also to learn from what went wrong or, or learn from how I reacted? Taking responsibility is very empowering. And it, mm. you know, it leads us to the warrior mindset versus the victim mindset. Sure, love that. But I just want to take a step back because this all sounds very like a great system and it's brilliant and James knows exactly what he's doing. Describe the story of how you got to where you are today. Where did you start? Well, how mm. have you arrived here at this point of having this like system of optimization? Mm. Well, you know, it started as a lot of our journeys, uh, very unconsciously competent as a very young child. So, you know, I grew up um, very different from the rest of my family an an optimist and very, very curious, mm. you know, to the, you know, the, the annoyance of everyone around me that just wanted to accept things are just the way they are, James. You don't need to understand everything. And I was like, well, I do. I want to know. I, I always thought there could be a better way. There mm. must be a better way. And so, you know, it started actually with cooking. So when my, when my mother first started working, so then both parents out working, you know, the food started to change. It was whatever we could get from Iceland, if you don't remember that from the back of the yes. right? <laughs> whatever reference. food we get. And I was like, and I, I remember saying to my mom, well, maybe the, can't we just have what we used to have? So, and she said, well, I have time. If you want better, you can do it yourself. And I said, mm -hmm. okay. So then I started to realize, okay, so actually if I take responsibility for the things that I'm unhappy with, then I solve them and I still get to be the person that gets on with everyone because that relationships have always been important to me. So mm -hmm. I learned very young that if I just, when I don't like something, I'll do something about it. Mm -hmm. so it started there, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, with the education system the way it is, you know, it wasn't, it didn't fit with my personality to, you know, the, the education system didn't really work for me. So I went through, I got very average grades and then I could really only identify my way of thinking as creative. So I ended up going to university and doing graphics and advertising and some creative uh, pursuits. Mm. It never felt quite right. I thought, yes, I'm creative, but these aren't the kind of problems that I want to be solving, but it's, it's what I knew. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after that, you know, lots of traveling around the world and eventually getting a job in television, which was great. I worked for 12 years for, for a big company, big broadcaster in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, working in live TV. So we had a lot of elements that I love, right? Lots of mm -hmm. people, high pressure environment where there was lots of problems to be solved and a lot of relationships to master. So it was great, mm -hmm. but it was still very much an extrinsic motivator for me mm -hmm. because the work itself wasn't fulfilling to me, mm. but what was fulfilling was, well done, James, you did a really great job, or <laughs> here's some more money, right? And right. so the, so really it was about how many promotions can I get and what can I do to learn more kit and learn more skills, but it just wasn't fulfilling. And it wasn't until I realized, ah, that young guy that was just figuring out what am I passionate about? you know, improving my life with and how can I take some responsibility for once I realized that he really knew what he was talking about, I started looking within a little bit. I started looking, you know, what, what's missing. Um, 
But I can't take all the credit for the move because really it was meeting my amazing wife and she was the catalyst for me because I was in this bubble and I was trying to solve the same problem within the sphere. Mm. I actually needed to go outside of that bubble. Mm. And so when I met Emily, um, you know, she started, you know, looking into this world of personal development and, and entrepreneurship and it piqued my interest because I didn't grow up in that kind of family. Mm. And so I, 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 over her shoulder, I'm looking into this world and thinking, this is amazing. This is, these are the books I'm already reading. I just didn't even consider that this could be a, a professional pursuit that would be my life. I thought this was just something I did for fun. Mm. So then I just, you know, I, I found, you know, who my mentor would be, you know, Brendan Bouchard, um, all his work from the High Performance Academy really spoke to me because it was methodical, yet there was a holistic approach. Sure. And I like the merriment of the two because I, I think that, Quite often in the world of personal development, there's a lot of information and not a lot of guidance as how you implement that in your life realistically. Mm. So I liked the very structured approach. And so, you know, I got certified as a high performance coach one year to the day that I left that career in television mm. um, after being challenged to by my coach at the time. Ah. And um, the rest is history, as they say. You know, I integrated that into working with amazing female entrepreneurs at the time. Mm -hmm. And then developing my own materials and, and utilizing those skills. And, and here we are, you know, seven or eight years later, mm -hmm. um, you know, still learning, still growing, still working out different recipes. But ultimately what it's taught me is right back from when I see a problem and I take it on to myself to find a better solution. That's really where I live. I love figuring out wonderful way to communicate how we can find more from ourselves and achieve whatever it is we want to achieve it's really that simple with a lot of details in between sure and i what i love about that story is well so many things um how did you know that it wasn't fulfilling what was the sensation that you were experiencing when you were in tv and it was like this is not it well the first thing was blame i blamed the environment for being toxic mm -hmm. so there was a period where things changed some lead ironically some leadership changed and I noticed that's mm -hmm. when I learned what real leadership was, right? It, leadership changed and it, the, the environment changed and it wasn't a happy environment. And I would say that's a toxic environment. And it was when my coach said to me, maybe James, it's not that the environment's toxic, but it's not, it doesn't resonate with you anymore. Mm -hmm. So in the environment, you don't work. Mm. I was like, ah, okay. So if I take responsibility, it's not me because not everyone in there felt the way I felt. Therefore it can't be the environment yeah it's me mm -hmm. and so that started to make me think about this whole idea of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and I that's when I really realized I was extrinsically motivated yes. so I looked okay well what is it that motivates me by me like mm. and that was hard I was like I don't know yeah wow and that was scary and hard and so that's when I started to do some work and try to follow what feels nice to go towards and so I remember my old university lecturer asked me if I'd go back to the uni and just speak to the kids or well, the kids. I mean, the you know, 18 year olds about life after uni it wasn't mm -hmm. even anything specific. Mm -hmm. And the invite alone felt good. And I thought, wow, that feels really interesting. I would love to do that. Yeah. So I was being a mentor. I was standing there mentoring these 18 year olds about life. And of course, mm -hmm. at the time, I was probably only in my mid twenties. So, you know, I wasn't that experienced in life, but there was something that like, some value that I could give. And I loved doing that. So I did that a couple of times. Yeah. And that was me starting to figure out, okay, there's, there's something here, right? Sure. There's something here around me learning something valuable and then having that conversation with others. Mm. And that's something that I notice always about you when you show up. So um, James is, people will know if they've listened to the Emily podcast, but I'm in a mastermind with Emily and James at the moment, and we have regular calls and James's capacity to give on these calls and just wants to enthuse about absolutely everything that he's learned, whether it's yesterday that he learned it or years ago. It's like this just energy of please know this because it will help you. And it just oozes out of you. So I want to reflect that to you because it's a very oh, lovely thing to be around. And this that speaks to something that James is obsessed with, which is about selfishness. Yeah. I would like you to explain your theory on selflessness and selfishness and all of the things to sort of spark some insights in our listeners. Yeah, so title being here, mm. it's selfish to put other people first. And I want to frame that because I'm just waiting for the, the triggered people to sort of say, oh, 
that's not what I was taught. <laughs> right. So if we rewind a little, mm. um, I am, and this is a self-imposed title, a recovering giver, mm. right? I have a coin, metaphorical. Yeah. You know, I'm a recovering giver. And mm. what that comes from is being a young child that may not have been perceived to be an academic mm. who, who you know, wasn't getting amazing grades at school, yet was in intelligent. I learned to receive love by doing things for people. So I had a mother who, who wasn't always very well. And, you know, my dad had a very stressful job. And it, I, I found that I could receive a lot of love by, by helping, mm. whether it's cleaning up or doing the dishes or, you know, or anything like that. And then I developed that, my, that part of my personality developed really strongly. And I learned that, wow, this is inside of me I love. But I took it a little bit too far. And so what happened was, is I didn't look after myself first because I was always taught, put other people first, James be selfless mm -hmm. and it wasn't until i thought about that that i thought wait a minute if i'm selfless how can i be more mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense if i want to you know be around amazing people and be of service to them surely i have to be running at 100 mm -hmm. or as close to it and how do i do that unless i'm paying attention to what it takes to get me to 100 mm -hmm. so therefore i have to put myself first so that I can be an amazing husband, so that I can be an amazing coach, so that I can serve and have all this energy, uh, no matter what's happening in my life, to, to be of service, right? And so it's, I know that a lot of people, you know, this whole putting other people first thing it comes from a good place, mm. but it, there's a damaging pattern neurologically that happens with that because then there's no value put on self-care. And then self-care becomes something we need to learn rather mm. being some, than something that's natural. Yeah. And there's a reason I wanted to segue onto that after sharing my feedback about how I experience you, because that's how you live, I'm assuming. You put yourself first. And yet the net result that I receive as your kind of, is being in your aura is as a giver. And that just goes to show people that putting yourself first means that you are actually achieving the result that you were intending by putting other people first. Exactly. Yeah. exactly yeah and the this stuff it feels like it's always such an effort to learn it but I, I wonder what you think do you think it's necessary to have to be so far away from your natural identity to come back to it or have you not developed a theory of everything yet I just well it's interesting you say that I mean I think that you know nothing nothing really develops in comfort and sometimes people haven't quite experienced enough pain to know that, that, that it's a point that there's a better way of being. And in fact, a lot of the planet are in a place of just not quite uncomfortable enough. And so they don't know there's a problem, mm. right? You ask, how are you doing? They're like, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. Mm. Have you ever considered what it'd be like to be amazing or to be mm. great? Mm. And so there is definitely something, and I obviously wouldn't want anyone to go through trauma and this is the challenge i think for any coach is that you want to be able to impact someone when they're young enough to have not gone through trauma mm. so that they can develop mm -hmm. and yet at the same time it's these tough things we go through in life that can make or break us mm -hmm. and that's the dance that we play right and so my goal is to really help people to viscerally feel something that could be better Mm. Mm -hmm. right and that can be a, that can be a journey some people feel easier than other people feel but that's where it's a personal recipe so if I'm working one-on-one -on -one with someone it's very different each time what yeah. we do is very different because it all depends what this person's life has been and how they receive information but it, the, the goal is the same it's how can I get you to feel what it is that you're aiming for mm -hmm. so that the commitment to the processes the work is processes that you'll be excited by like running a running machine right you would not do that if you if you couldn't feel what it would be like to be a bit fitter yes right right because who wants to just run on a on a running machine in a room i mean there's, there's nothing fun about that but people get addicted to it because they start to measure the metrics they start to feel the results mm. And speaking of measuring metrics, do you, with your clients, typically measure metrics? Is there some kind of like output metrics that people can start to think about measuring in their life in, in yeah. order to judge this? 
Yeah, totally. Uh, again, it's very different for people. Everyone likes measuring things in different ways. Um, so let's say we're talking about a very, very common one is people's morning and evening routines, right? Getting used to the fact they're not sleeping well and getting used to running off of, you know, maybe 60% maximum every day because they haven't slept well mm -hmm. and then we've got this whole process of okay well i'll try these morning and evening routines but how do i know it's working mm -hmm. so there's many many routes that we can take now there's literal metrics like wearing an aura ring or, or sleep tracking devices which i love because then it's something real that we can talk about yeah. right but also there's just how you feel and i think it's very important regardless of using tech or not to start to develop, develop um, a connection to how you feel. Mm. But can you feel when you've had a good night's sleep? Can you feel the difference between a craving and what my body needs to eat? Mm. And developing that sensitivity is very, very possible. I mean, it's, it's it, because of being an over giver in the past, I used to have a lot of IBS, you know, and from being such an emotional wreck. And so I learned, to become very sensitive to what I what my body needs and what it doesn't need. So I know now I'm like, I need a steak or I need a salad. I know what I need because mm. I can feel it. And you see, I truly believe you can develop that. And so if people can start, you know, they wake up having done this new evening routine, routine right? Mm. And they wake up in the morning, they just write down, what, what am I feeling, right? How long is it taking me to focus? And just start writing your feelings down. Mm. Now, yes, there are scores out of 10 and various metrics we can use but i'm i'm a believer in a personal process that you come up with with mm -hmm. guidance because then it's something that's a way you like to learn yeah and then after a while and this is the thing with any kind of growth is it takes time mm -hmm. and so if you're if you're measuring for two three four weeks without measuring you might not notice any difference but if you look back at those notes and start to see oh look my scores are higher or i I'm not reaching for the coffee pot so quickly or <laughs> these other things are happening. Um, you'll start to see the, the difference even mm. maybe before you feel it. Mm. I love that. And I, I really, this is why, and people on the surface, like a high performance coach can look very structural and very kind of like there's a system and there's external things. But what I really love about the way you work is it is like we will, we can have the tech and you and I could nerd out about science and tech and yeah. geek build until the cows come home, but we both do the same thing. It's like we learn the roadmap and we learn the systems, but we throw it out the window to preferentially um, preserve the human process and the human experience through it right yeah and we have everything we need here yeah the and best biofeedback in the world right <laughs> yes somebody said to me the other day do you do biofeedback i was like mm, you have a brain and a body yeah. so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but a lot of people are desensitized of right course. or they're, they're used to pain it's like um you you might ask someone 10 times do you wake up with any pain and they say no and then the 10th time it's like well i mean i do have this like restless leg thing or i do have this other thing yeah why didn't you mention it first time oh i'm just so used to it and so mm. people get used to their pain they get used to their stress they get used to the experience of life and that's why trying to get them to feel what life could be even for a moment is mm. is, is an anchor and i think you know once we have an anchor mm -hmm. magic mm. It's powerful, isn't it? And you yeah. and Emily both do a fantastic job of this kind of like, what do you desire? Like what's in there? So if you were going to give our listeners like a little tip of like, how do you connect to that anchor? Like, how do you even start to think of it? Particularly if you're so used to pain or something, some struggle, how mm -hmm. do you start to even think about what's possible? What's your kind of top tips? Yeah, it's very easy. Um, my number one tip is learn to be very present. And so we, I've got a little exercise. If you want, we can do it right now. Yeah. It takes yes. like a minute yes. maybe less than a minute you want to do it yes so this is so i developed this practice because i have a very interesting brain <laughs> <laughs> i was a sleepwalker and a sleep talker and i still am quite active i don't walk in my sleep i don't stand up and walk anymore but i used to i dream you know I'm a, I'm a very um intense dreamer and so i had to learn how to be present and meditation initially for me was it was challenging mm. and so i thought well again how do I develop a rest before me to get that result? Yeah. So I came up with what I call the three room theory, right? Or master your busy mind. And so let's do this now yeah. together. Yes. And all the listeners can do it. Okay. Yes. So if you just um, get comfy in your seat, mm -hmm. take a nice deep breath in your nose, all the way to your belly and out. Just settle in and close your eyes. 
Now, I'd like you to imagine that there are three rooms in your mind. On the left, we have the past habitual library. Now, this is where we keep all the memories of everything we've ever done, all our achievements, all of our traumas, all of our pain, all of our successes, all of our joy, everything. Now, this room is fantastic, but we have to remember that this room is a void of time. It's already happened, so we don't always have to be there. So I'd like you to reach over to the door to that room and just slide it shut. Now, if we look over to the other side of our mind, on the right here, we have the future creative workshop. This is where we go to plan out what we want to do in the future, right? I imagine it being full of easels and beautiful drawings and all the things that we want to create. Now, again, this room is void of time. It hasn't happened yet. So if we spend too much time there, we can feel anxious. We can feel frustrated that things haven't happened. So I want you to know, as amazing as this room is, you can go there anytime. But for now, we're going to step outside of the room. We're going to reach over and we're going to slide that door shut. Now we're left in the present room. Now, what's wonderful about this room right here, right now, is it's the only room that actually exists. It's the temperature of the air around you. It's any noises that you can hear. It's any sensations that you've got in your body. How does your bum feel on the seat? What do your toes feel like? Are there any smells in the room? Are there any noises from outside the room? All of this is happening right here in the moment. What's great about this room is it's, it's the only room that you can understand what's going on in your body, in your mind, in this moment. And it's the only time you can actually take action that's going to do something relevant to that future room. So you can come here anytime you like. And just as an example of how powerful this room is, if I was to tell you that we have five seconds left, it wouldn't sound like a long time, would it? But let's try. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. That's awesome, James. That's like superpower level of presence mm. because as the listeners will know, I have this huge like library of stuff, I'm not talking about past library. And I want to come back to that because we need to talk about Dewey Decimal Systems for our past library. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff that I do with a lot of different languages and lexicons. And essentially what you've just run us through is like a somatic awareness practice without yeah. using any other fancy language, without like even getting into, ooh, we're being in our body right now. Like just focusing on not time traveling with the mind mm -hmm. is very somatic presence filled. And it's so powerful because it just centers you without it being like a Sam Harris meditation where you're like, well, hang on, what a second? Like, it's, I don't want to meditate right now, but that's a mini meditation that I hope every single one of our listeners did and really landed in themselves. It's so powerful because for me, especially when there's a lot happening in these rooms, right? And there's books flooding out the library at me and there's, I'm stuck in the future creative workshop wondering why things haven't happened yet. I just think, oh, I just need to go to another room. Mm. And I shut and I shut and it's it's so grounding and time slows down time is I mean Einstein had it right it's so it's so subjective and 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 you know we're so in control of how we view time mm. um and in a world that you know we have such an amazing world we live in where there's such access to information but there comes with that the challenge of managing all that information yeah. And for those of us that want to do something really important and be of service from a high performance perspective, yeah. what we've just done allows this brain to rather, rather than become a higher performer by adding strategies, we become a higher performer by just taking away everything that isn't relevant, which is 99% of the stuff in your brain <laughs> in, in this moment, because in this moment, it's just us. Yeah. And this is so important for people. If you are at all like interested in personal development, but what people are telling you to do is like crash through barriers into the future or really add strategies, or if you just have the perfect this routine or that routine or that kind of stuff that's additional, it's not personal development. It's taking you away from this thing right here, right now. Mm -hmm. And that what I love about you, James, is you bridge this world of kind of like, yeah, high performance personal development, but you're absolutely centered on 
this second and now this second and now this second, which is actually in, in my world, very kind of somatically trauma informed and led. So <laughs> it's great. I appreciate that. And it's uh, you're right. I think sometimes the terminology of high performance is perceived in a different way. And, you know, even to this day, I'm still trying to work out how to communicate that. Um, but it's, um, you know, there are so many gifts of strategies and everything in the world, but it can be overwhelming. And I think that it is just very important that people very simply just become very aware of themselves. You know, I think that there's so much information that you're brain and your body tries to give you until it gets to the point where things start falling off because you haven't listened mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not even joking right mm -hmm. um so you know it's such a gift when you start to listen to yourself and care enough to listen to yourself yeah that alone can create such massive change it really can sure and um, just to touch back on the Dewey Decimal System that I mentioned, James has tons of other like tools, that, loads of tools, but like in a conversation that we had personally, but basically James was saying to me that my library shelves were not very well organized and I mm. needed to put different things to the front of my library so that they were easier access. And it's all of mm. that, you know, like what do you go to from your past experiences, your self-reference for who you are and how you show up? Yeah, that's why I call it a library because it's our responsibility to stack what we see. And what's the shelf that most people don't stack is their confidence shelf or mm -hmm. their self-love shelf. Mm -hmm. You know, you've done many things that you've achieved many things that are more than deserving of confidence. Mm. And yet not everyone stacks that confidence so that when they look for self-worth, the, the shelf's empty. So they assume, oh, well, I'm obviously no good. Right. But it's just because we haven't stacked it. And, you know, Brendan himself, I won't steal his theory like this is a great great very simple term he has and that is that your confidence is as a result of your competence mm. it's a confidence competence loop so when i become competent i get to recognize uh, to gain some confidence from that which gives me more confidence to become more competent and it's a loop right mm. we must stack it the same with our self-love you know we do something nice for ourselves <laughs> we say, oh that i did that for myself i create time for myself there stack the self-love shelf Mm. So how you feel about you is based on how well you've organized that library and how, you know, what information is easily accessible yeah. and what information you have to dig for um, is, is very evident in how we feel about ourselves. And so I'm, I'm still arranging my library. I'm, <laughs> I'm not off the hook, right? Yeah, yeah. never ends, does it, James? Like, oh, no, we need to go and, like, rearrange that shelf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's funny as well, because I think sometimes that if you notice that a shelf is, like, not, fully organized or isn't full enough of books you can actually go oh do you know what I'm going to go and choose to do some of the experiences which will enable me to build that library up I guess yeah yeah no totally I mean that that's what that's what the future future creative workshops for right if I look at my library I can actually gain some information about okay so how can I use my future creative workshop to design fulfillment that when it's then logged in my library allows the present moment to be fueled then going forward into the future again, right? Yeah. It's a dance, right? None of those rooms are wrong, but there's a real responsibility of how to use those rooms to serve you mm -hmm. rather than allow those rooms to use you. Yep, and to like overwhelm and uh, over like dominate all your thoughts and stuff. Yeah, anxiety and fear do not exist in the present moment. Right. They don't. Yes. Anytime you feel anxiety or fear, it's related to something in one of those two rooms. It's not about the moment, unless you're sat opposite like a lion right. that's about right. to eat you. Then yeah, maybe it'd be relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe have some fear right now. Yeah, yeah. no, and it's great because there's this kind of um, dance between the human psyche and the past and the future, and the, it doesn't exist in the present. Like there's oh. only here right now, mm -hmm. and from here right now is the only place in which you can move into that future room. So you get right. to really take the power back. Yeah, which is so exciting. It's so exciting. Right, think about <laughs> that. Yeah. You get to, in a moment, take your power back, mm. just like that. Mm. I mean, just think about that. Like everyone listens, just think about that. Anywhere where you're feeling weaker or disempowered, you can take it back. Mm. And anyone who listened to the Emily podcast now gets why Emily and James are so, such a great pairing because you've got Emily with all this kind of like desires and all the kind of feminine side of it and all the strategy and the structure and the business. And like, she's a legend with like funnels and landing pages. I mean, honestly, beyond me. Um, but James comes in with all of this like 
self stuff, this really centered who you are and how to get to it. And that partnership and pairing is just perfect, in my opinion. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, we, we're, I, we're very fortunate to have found each other. Um, it's been a beautiful journey and, it, you know, it really is. I mean, in so many ways, we're very different. Mm. And that's why it works, right? And I think this is an interesting thing of relationships, actually. If you think about a lot of the time in relationships, people are looking for shared interests. Right. But I'll tell you what, shared values mm. are more important. Yes. You know, where you want to go. You know, Emily and I both think outside the box. We both believe there's a better way. Mm. How we do it, it's very different. Mm. But that's the value. And I think that if we, we can take that concept to yourself, relationship with you, right? Mm. To um, your team, to, to anything. But I think that values and understanding them for the business of you as well, so, so, so important. And I think a lot of people aren't aware. If you ask people, what are your values? Yeah. How many people would know? because mm. we don't get taught this at school it's like no. we don't get taught by the way work out what your core values are right it's like it's not i think we should change education and the world of like so many things we need to change james there's a, yeah there's, there's there's a lot of updates for sure um and uh, there's a lot of responsibility on the on the parents there to to sort of start with that but you're right i mean you know this is a relationship the relate you know i always say to to any coaches or service-based entrepreneurs out there you are your number one client so if you don't know what that client's values are, how do you know you're serving them? Mm, mm, absolutely. I, and to find someone who you can connect with and, and build on those values together is, is so important as well. Yeah. Share with me and our listeners. So anyone who listened to the Emily episode, and you don't have to, but Emily's business and the whole thing has been through a lot of transitions, a lot of changes. And it is, I get the impression that Emily drives the ship. Oh, yeah. How do you deal with that? Like as a, as a man in relationship, and we did dig into this and James is interviewing with me before he's heard his, the episode with his wife, by the way. So we did dig into this a little bit from Emily's perspective of how it works. And people know that myself and Brace have our dynamic and Brace is a manifester, an emotional manifester, as is James. People will know about human design if they're following. So tell us how the dynamic works from your perspective, James. So, I mean, you know, we figured out very early on, you can only have one person driving the ship. Right. And that's in any company. You can't have two people with the same responsibilities. It's never going to work. Right. Um, I mean, in terms of the male ego dynamics thing, that's never been a problem. We, we don't think we don't think the way everyone else thinks. Right. So we did realize very early on that our relationship was a model that hadn't been modeled for us. So even though we were willing to do things a new way, we did get coaching from a, an amazing you know, relationship and entrepreneurial coach. Um, Marla Mattinson, I'll shout her out, she's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked with her for quite a while. And, and what that really did is it helped us own our own roles for ourselves first, so that we could come together and, you know, exponentially be more powerful, right? And so it's really owning that and having very open relationships. So whether it's an intimate relationship or work relationship, you know, understanding each other's values, um, giving each other's time to express emotions and feelings um, and, and knowing your role as well, like professionally. Yeah. And then outside of the business, we've had to, and this is probably took the longest thing, is to really make sure we have a cutoff, right? So for the day. Mm -hmm. So the difference between me and Emmy is I, I, like, I, I work and then I stop. I work and then I stop. I need those kind of like gaps in between. Yeah. Emily is very rare breed. She could... She could work 12 hours straight if she didn't realize at this point now that it wouldn't be good for her, but she could. Mm. And so she had to learn to sort of change that rhythm a little bit. And then I had to change my rhythm. And then ultimately in the evenings, we came to a point where we would go for a walk normally, we still do. And we'd say, right, let's anything we want to talk about the business that we want to just get off our chest before we close off any business talk. Right. So then there's a strict kind of like, now we're husband and wife. Now being probably a very boring husband and wife that love what they do so much. We still talk about the industry, but it's not problem solving in the business. In the business. Mm -hmm. So we have clear defined things. And so there's business partners, Emily and James, there's husband and wife, Emily and James. And they, you know, it's not that it's so cut and dry that during the day we're just serious, but it's like <laughs> understanding each other's needs in those mm -hmm. roles mm -hmm. and, you know, constant communication. 
Um, I mean, there's a lot more to it than that, but really we've developed our relationship in this, with the same intention that we've developed ourselves and we develop our programs. It's just very, very intentional. Um, and now we've been, and we've been married 10 years, um, but we've been working together for almost eight years in the same house. You know, now we have separate offices, but initially that was very close, yeah. but we're in the same house, right? 24 seven. Yeah. And thank you for giving us that insight into your kind of personal world, because I think it is so interesting to me how there are some conventional models that people have. Um, and then there are the people who are doing it differently. And and you are mm. definitely that kind of couple. And whilst it's very different with myself and Brace, because we're not romantically engaged, we've messed up totally in, in like our kind of dynamic, because a bit like yourself and Emily, I'm the leader. I'm the one who will work all our, our hours and all of those kinds of things. But right people, right seats is like mm. an obsession of mine mm. but finding them isn't like you go oh that's my seat and you sit there you actually need to work at it you need to kind of get of that you don't need to do all the things or that you do want to do all the things and all of that journey so well the exciting point of that is is that you get to th there is a salute a perfect solution right there is a solution to that problem um and it's a one thing you get to work on yeah. it may not be easy but the reward of things that aren't easy are, you know, it's the law of polarity. When something's not easy, when, when it is discovered, it's game changing. Mm -hmm. That's the motivation. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I now know from experience, the harder something is, the bigger the reward is on the other side. Right. Yes. It's absolutely. just true. Yes. Yeah. And the bigger the, re the relief when you're over it as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So with all of that said, I know that Emily's like changing things and the, the membership things that are happening with I Heart My Life. What's up with James in the coming month, yeah. year or so? I mean, my role's always been different. I mean, I, you know, I started doing a bit of everything as well as the coaching, but I think now we're, we're doing a lot less live programs. So I used to, there was a point where I was coaching in many different programs and, and, and had less time for my own work. And I would always have my own clients, but now we're, we're doing a lot less of that um, and we're sort of settled here in Austin. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been, I've now got the growth edge. So now, even though what I do is the same for, for the right people, mm -hmm. it includes guys as well. So I haven't forgotten about you. Yeah. All right, because we've got to be careful <laughs> yes. because otherwise, otherwise these ladies are going to take over the world and we need to be in it together, right? Yes. <laughs> it's not about one or the other people, it's about together. Mm -hmm. um, but I... Uh, so yeah, I mean, really, I'm still doing what I'm doing, but but one of the things I'm most excited, I love communities. I mean, I love one-on-one -on -one coaching, but I, I keep that very, I don't have, I don't like a lot of one-on-one -on -one clients because I go very deep. Yeah. So what I really have I've been doing is, is plugging into other companies and kind of doing what I've been doing for I Heart My Life. So there's a lot of that happening, plugging and serving other communities um, and just some interesting projects coming up with some interesting people here in Austin, some of which you've met. Mm -hmm. um ultimately with the you know i just really want to i love coming up with solutions for people being happier and healthier and, and more successful whatever that means and so i love people i love getting out and meeting people and serving in any way i can and so there's lots of interesting projects coming up not all of which i can talk about but <gasps> secret projects but there's some fun <laughs> stuff and then within i heart my life you know next year we've got some amazing you know events and things um and retreats and some amazing guests coming on those retreats. So they're going to be pretty epic because that's, an, you know, we couldn't do a lot of it over the last couple of years, obviously, right. but yeah, being in person, it can be challenging for people, but it is, it's a dynamic. If you manage the environment properly, mm. it, it's just another level of, of implementation. Uh, and it's just fun. I think the world needs people. And I think that this is wonderful, but yeah. there's nothing like being with people. Right. And it's it's so silly as well, because this has just become the habit, but you are probably, I don't know, what, 20 minutes, half an hour away from me right, right. now, this moment, yeah. and we, we could have done, done this in person. person. And we yeah. should have done. And it's just like, this is so easy, but it's not the same. Not and the same. I think that the more that we can get back to human to human contact, the the better life is like I've I've been out this week James I've actually seen humans yeah. <laughs> it's like wow <laughs> like that feels different yeah. so so yeah um and speaking of which let's just talk about the UK because aren't you guys heading over to the UK like soon next week yeah next, next week. week we are heading to the UK um so some personal seeing some family we're we're doing some things with some, with some clients over there mm -hmm. um so we tend to do whenever we travel we want to you know we've got like clients we've got kind of people on the list all over the world right so if we yeah. travel we want to try and put something together so we've got a fun mixer happening 
we've got like a group VIP day happening. Um, there is still a spot for an individual day, but we're trying to make sure we've got enough time. We've got to remember our family as well. So I'm seeing my family over there and some friends and just visiting London. Like we love London. Yeah. It's kind of our second home. Obviously we lived there. I lived there for a lot of my life and um, Emily lived there uh, and us together which we, we met. Mm. And so that's fun. Yes, yeah, so we're going over there and um, escape the Texas heat for, for a week. Hopefully right. not to see the rain, but you know. Yeah. We'll, well see. they're having heat over, <laughs> over there at the moment, apparently. Like they think 30, like four is hot. And I'm well, like, to be fair, when it's hot there, it's humid hot. Here it's dry. So yeah. it's yeah, there's but we like being Austin people now. <laughs> I do. Yeah, you're, in, so you're, you're already a proud Texan. You don't even know. I that. really am. Like I feel <laughs> Texan inside me somewhere. It's like I've got used to the wildlife and everything. It's like, yeah. <laughs> but yes. So any other things that you feel like you want to share with our audience, James, today? I mean, you know, ultimately, I think that what's really important is to know that there are some really wonderful people of service in the world and they're not all salesy and then they're not all about the bottom line. Um, Victoria is one, right? I'm one. And just sometimes it's, you know, just listen and watch and reach out and, and, and ask and ask. Right. That doesn't cost anything. And just please just take some time to just pay attention to yourself. That's all I would say. Right. That everyone in the world that you love and that, you know, you want to be your best for is going to benefit so much from you just paying attention to what you need. Mm. And it sounds so obvious and quite obvious, quite often the simplest things people don't listen to because it seems too easy. Mm. Just trust me, just pay attention to yourself, you know, think about what it is you need and, and don't just do it for you, do it for everyone around you that's going to benefit from someone who's happier, healthier and more vibrant. And it's really that simple. Mm. I love that, James. And we will put links to where you can hunt James down uh, in all of the show notes. And he, like, as James was saying, we have paid services, but we do so much for free and we're around and like we have Instagram accounts where you can send us DMs. Like I'm just encouraging you to do this for James. I don't know whether he'll accept that, but like you can oh, totally. do it for me. Yeah. I love talking to people. Exactly. And we're very available, even though like we do high level stuff. So get in contact, if not with us, at least with yourself. Yes. Well, please with yourself. Number one. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with me today, James. Thank you so much for your invite. I could sit and talk to you all day. It's good fun. I know. <laughs> All right, you take care. And I'm sure we will see each other very soon. We will. <laughs> Stay informed with all things Unveil. Sign up for the newsletter at unveilenterprises.com forward slash sign up.